right, good morning, everyone. Glad you're here today. Happy November. Soon be Thanksgiving time and Christmas. Hallelujah. It's a wonderful time of the year. And Father, we love you and thank you for this day, for your blessings. Father, we have come to worship you. We have come to lift our voices to you and praise and shout our hallelujahs to you today. Lord, we seek your face and we just invite you to come today. Move, Lord. Touch our hearts and lives here today in a special way. And we give you all the glory and praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's do it. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the people of God sing his praise all over the land. Everyone in the valley, come and lift your voice. All those on the mountain top be glad. Shout for joy. Rise up and praise him. He deserves a Heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the people of God sing his praise all over the land. Everyone in the valley, come and lift your voice. All those on the mountain top be glad, shout for joy, rise up and praise him. He deserves our love. Worship the Holy One with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Rise up and praise Him. Rise up and praise Him. He deserves our love. Rise up and praise Him. Worship the Holy
your mercy, your grace. And Father, we adore you. We glorify you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. Oh, blessed be your name. Great are you, Lord, and we seek your face. Have your way here today, Lord Jesus. We open our hearts to you, and we give you all our praise, all, all our praise, Jesus. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, it's your breath. Cry out to him. And all the earth will 
shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. in a position where you must trust me, where I will walk through every step, every day. I will take you where you need to be, and as you look around, you will see me moving, and you'll say, that is my God. That is my God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, we trust in you today. Father, our eyes are upon you, Lord. We are following you, Lord Jesus. Lord, no matter what comes our way, we will not fear, Father, for our trust is in you. And Lord, I pray that you just bind us together, Father, as one, the Lord, that we will be. Lord, a group that cannot be taken down. Father, that we will go forth in your name. And Lord, we will stand firm on the word of God and it will go forth before us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we will be an army, Lord Jesus, that cannot be crushed. We are an army that cannot be crushed. And we will stand before you and shout our hallelujahs. Father, we will trust you, Lord. You will never leave us and you will never forsake us, Father. You said it in your word. We trust your word. We speak your word, Father. Lord, because it will not return void to you. Lord, you said this in your word, and we trust you. And we thank you, Father, for your promises. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord. You are worthy. Glory, hallelujah. Oh, give him another shout. We're not done. Let's worship hallelujah. him. He deserves our worship. He deserves our praise. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus, Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name Just wanna speak the 
I shout the victory today. I praise you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, hallelujah. Oh, he is mighty, the mighty to save Jesus. Jesus. Glory. I, the Lord thy God, will make it clear to you that you need not be ashamed to speak my name. Yes, yes. I, the Lord thy God, have gone before you. I will continue to go before you. Jesus. I will be beside you, and I will be behind you. Thank you. Yea, I will walk yes. with you through every difficulty that you may have in your life. Yes. Yes. It is not of me, for I am a giver of life, Yes. And I will give to you blessings Hallelujah. upon blessings upon blessings when you ask. Yes. Speak not loudly. Oh, you need not worry about speaking loudly. Hallelujah. Speak my name over anything and everything and plead my blood. Thus saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Father, we join together right now in the name of Jesus. And, yes. and we speak to anxiety and depression. Yes. And we command it to be gone from these people. Amen. We command it to be gone from Amen. this sanctuary. Yes. This sanctuary where, yes. where we are free in Jesus. Yes. We just speak to those things that have attacked our, our friends and our relatives. We command them to be gone in the mighty name of Jesus of Christ. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We deserve it. We deserve it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. I want all of us to stand, if you would, if you, if you, feel, if you can. We need to speak the name of Jesus over our land. Yes, we do. We have a very important election coming up Tuesday. Don't be in fear, because always remember... God has got this. He's in control. And no matter what happens, he's still for us and not against us. And what I see is the seriousness of this election because our nation's at a, a fork. Either we're going to continue the way of our founding fathers or we're going to steer off to another direction of socialism. And... We need to speak against that yes. today. Amen. Amen. We need to plead the blood of Jesus Christ over this land. Yes. We need to pray for revival to break out in America. Yes. And if revival break out in the voting booth tomorrow Amen. or Tuesday. Amen. And I want to encourage you as Christians, if you haven't voted, get to the polls and vote. I believe we have a responsibility to do that yes. because when Christians sit out, we allow the evil, the ungodly, to make our choices and decisions for our nation. Yes, that's right. And it's time that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ stop being ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. It's time that we stop being afraid to you know, express our truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes. He's still ruling and reigning. He's still the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God can turn this nation around. Yes. Amen. So let's go together and just let's pray a prayer of agreement. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And Father, we speak 
your name over this nation and this land. Father God, we call upon you this very moment, and we ask, Lord God, that you would move through this land, that there would be a spirit of revival to flow through this nation right now. And Lord God, that the decisions that are going to be made for Tuesday, Lord God, Lord, that they would be ones that lead us into your righteousness, that lead us back to your holiness, that leads us back to a place where we honor and respect you once again. And Lord God, we're praying, Lord, for such a move uh, on Tuesday, Lord God, that, Lord, that the leaders that you put in, the, 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 the president, Presidency, the, the Senate, the, the congressmen, Lord God, wherever they're being elected at, Lord God, there would be people who hunger and thirst after your righteousness, Lord. There would be people that have a desire to see this nation turn around and return back to you, Lord God. And Lord God, we pray against the, the things that are going to be going on and against this, these, these are our leaders, Lord God. We come against those right now in the name of Jesus. They have no right or authority in our land and our nation. And Lord God, we call those things that are not as though they are this very moment and we're declaring, Lord God, that your person that you have chosen and the people you have chosen to be put into our government will be the ones that get put into place, Lord God. We're believing you to perform your word and we're believing, Lord God, that there be such a revival break forth from this, Lord God, that this nation would come back together as one, one in unity because, Lord, you tell us in your word a house divided cannot stand and, Lord God, we're not going to allow the enemy to steal this nation from us. We're not going to allow the political, the, those who are on the other side, Lord God, that are are doing things that honor the enemy to have their freedom and liberty in this area. And Lord God, we're asking, Lord, that you would just rush in in a great and mighty way. And Lord, we are not going to walk in fear. We're not going to walk in doubt because you are going to work everything according to your purpose and according to your will. It will be accomplished. And we claim it right now. And Lord, right now we speak peace. Over, over every anxious heart in this room and watching online, we speak peace, 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 peace. God's peace flow to you this very moment. God's peace flow to you this very moment. Right now, right now, just receive the peace. Peace, peace, peace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Let's praise him. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. I like that. Everything that has breath. How many got breath? Because I got breath, I got a reason to praise him. Amen. You know, so many people are out there trying to win the lottery. I don't play the lottery, so I'm not, I know I'm never going to win it. But I've already won the lottery. I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I'm already a victor. I'm already a winner. Amen? God is so, so good. Well, I want to welcome everyone here this morning. And you know what? We're fulfilling Scripture this morning. It says, forsake not the assembling yourselves together. And you know, and I know it was a rainy night and a rainy morning and a predicting rain, and people came to the house of God anyway. Amen? You know, and, and sometimes I'm always amazed. Oh, no, it's a snowflake. Cancel everything. I'll never forget when I first came to uh, Augusta here. It was a Wednesday night, and they were predicting snow flurries, and, and I got call after call after call. You're going to cancel service tonight, aren't you? And I go, what for? I'm from a northern state. You don't cancel service unless the snow's about this high. <laughs> Amen? Amen. And I am, I am just so grateful about being in the house of God today and assembling together with brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and you know what? The Bible tells us we need to do that because who's coming again? Jesus is coming again. And I think it would be awesome. You know, if it happened tonight, that would be great, wouldn't it? You know, the only thing that would be maybe bad about that is I still want to see some loved ones get in. And I believe with my whole heart that's the only reason that he hasn't come back yet because he's being patient with those and answering our prayers, waiting for those who are going to get saved here to jump on in. Amen. Amen. So God is so good. We're going to continue in our series, Recalibrate. And this one is going to be another one of those maybe hard messages when I get to the end. Do you want tickle or do you want truth? Okay, you said it. I got it on tape. Amen? And the, so the message title uh, this morning is this, and our Recalibrate series is this, Forgiven Forgivers. I've had people tell me they would rather have me preach on tithing <laughs> than on forgiveness. I didn't look a certain way, did I? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> but anyway, Forgiven Forgivers. And the word recalibrate, which is our series is based on, is, is simply the meaning of this, is a process of making adjustments or modifying some things to, ins to ensure accuracy, precision, and optimal performance. I don't know about you, but I want optimal performance. Yeah. Yeah. I want to be there, especially when the trump of God sounds. Right. Amen. Amen. And I know that one of the most difficult topics we find in the Bible, especially with uh, with unsaved people and especially with Christian people is the subject of forgiveness. Amen? And we're all for forgiveness when we need it. Yes. Everyone for forgiveness when you need it? But we're not so favorable of forgiveness when we are the ones who have to give it. Oops, I heard of oops there. Ready? So you want me to go to tithing real quick? First John 1 and 9 says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is what? Just. Faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How much unrighteousness? All of it. So my first point this morning of the message you're going to like. We're going to look at the benefits of receiving God's forgiveness. You know what? If all God did was save us, that would be enough. Amen? But he just didn't stop with forgiving us. When we receive his forgiveness, it opens up the windows of heaven to pour out blessings upon us in our lives. I don't know about you, but life is hard enough. But to have God's blessings when life is hard, that is awesome. Amen? And so, the, the, so 
what we do with forgiveness is going to affect our earthly lives here now. What we do with forgiveness is going to affect our mental health. Some of you are looking around, that person needs to do some forgiving, right? And what we do with forgiveness is going to affect our eternity. I, I can tell you right now, saints of God, there are so many great benefits in forgiveness. And the first benefit, and this is going to be stuff we already know, but we need to be reminded of it from time to time. The first benefit of God's forgiveness is this. God forgives our personal sins. Isn't that awesome? He forgives it. So what does the word forgive mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you real quick here. Forgive means to pardon to cancel, to remit. And I like this definition. It is to release the debtor from their obligation to pay. And here is a simple fact, saints of God. We all are debtors before we found Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And every one of us in this room, every person who's ever been born has a debt to pay because none of us are perfect. None of us have done righteous all the time. Sometimes we do stupid things. Everyone agreed, said? And sometimes we do it intentionally. And because of that, we have a great debt of sin that must be paid in full. But the problem is, saints of God, we can't pay it in full. It's not possible for us to pay our debt sin in full. If it were possible, Christ would not come to the cross to have to die. But he came to the cross to die in our place for us and to exchange his righteousness, if you will, and to remove our unrighteousness. You see, there's going to come a day where we have to give an accounting for our lives. Does that make you want to wake up just a moment here? And if you look at God's accounting before we're saved, he's got a whole list of things that we have done wrong. Everyone agree with that? But now when he looks at us, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we receive his forgiveness, what God does now is he removes that side of that list, that accounting, and he replaces it, ready for this, with the righteousness of his son. And when God looks at our account now, he sees righteousness because Christ gives us his righteousness. He imputes to us his righteousness, and now we are the righteousness of God in Christ this very moment. And when you look at my account sheet in heaven, and guess what? God the Father only sees the righteousness of his Son, and all my past is washed away, hallelujah, never to be remembered in God's eyes ever, ever, ever again. Think about that, what God has done for us. Oh, that is awesome, isn't it? And now remember, Jesus came to the cross to die so we could have that righteousness and our sins forgiven. Amen? Now, Luke 23 and 34 reads, reads this way. Jesus said, now you have to remember the background here. Jesus is hanging on the cross. And those who are crucifying him are down there laughing. They're mocking. And they're getting ready to cast lots for his clothes. They're getting ready to strip him. He's God. Amen? He could have called a thousand angels down. He could have called thunderbolts down. He could have set Sodom and Gomorrah-type bombs down. But this is what he does. Luke 23, through 30, Luke 23 and 34, Jesus said, you ready for this? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then they divided up his clothes and cast lots. And what's Jesus doing? He is asking God the Father to please forgive these people and pardon those people. And you know how God the Father is going to do that? Through Jesus' sacrifice. By being crucified, he is going to forgive these people who are wronging him 1,000% here. And what he's saying is simply this, Father, even though they rightly earned condemnation and your judgment, rightly earned it, I want to pay for their great sins. I want to die for them and in their place. And so I can say this right now, one of the greatest sins was, being, was happening right now 
They were denying the Lord of glory, and they were crucifying him. They were mocking him. They were stripping him of his clothes. And yet Jesus prayed for, if you want to use the term, his enemies, and asking that faith and forgiveness would come to their lives before they ever knew they needed it. And before they ever asked him for it, he wanted to see forgiveness. And as Jesus is praying for these people and us, right below him are these people who are trying to crucify him. What does this show us? One thing it shows us here, and I don't think I have this in the note, is, is this. I don't think it's on the, on the screen up, up on the top up here. But Jesus is now revealing to us that there is one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus, and he is that meteor, mediator. Amen? Amen? I don't have to go to someone else. I don't have to wait till someone's been dead 300 years or, or all these kind of things. I can go straight to God. I can still go straight to the God through Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ is always at the right hand of God, uh, uh, the Father, making intercession for who? Us. So why do I need another mediator? I can go right to Jesus. Hallelujah. I've got the hotline to Jesus. Because of my salvation, because I've been forgiven, I have open communication with the God of the universe. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Jesus provided forgiveness for mankind before we ever knew we needed it. Remember, Jesus Christ was slain from when? The foundations of the world. Amen? You see, when we understand what salvation is plus the, the benefits of salvation is, we begin to understand that there is, we now have power over sin in our lives. Aren't you glad you have power over, over sin in your life right now? His forgiveness, his grace, his mercy gives us power over those things. And hear me now, we are no longer slaves to sin. Amen? For who the Son is set free is what? free indeed and we are now forgiven children of the most high god jesus forgiveness gives us freedom from the consequences of eternity and eternity from the sins we've committed here amen i am no longer going to face consequences in heaven for what i have done wrong down here that's glorious because i don't know about you because my list may have been very long some of you may have had longer ones I don't have to face the consequences now because Jesus faced them for me. Amen? Now, with that said, that doesn't mean that sometimes we don't face earthly consequences. We can be forgiven by God. That doesn't mean we don't face earthly consequences sometimes. Amen? We don't like that one, right? And because of forgiveness now, my slate is clean. My conscience is clear and God is not going to punish me for my past sins that are under his blood because he has forgiven me. He does the same for you. Amen? Now, how many have ever been pulled over by a police officer for speeding? I think three or four times in my life, and I've never got out of one of them. Yeah. But... How many have ever been pulled over for speeding and the cop just gives you a warning? And you kind of go, oh. kind of, right? You know what that's a type of? A little tiny type of? Forgiveness. Because you deserved it, no matter what you said, right? <laughs> the next thing is this, and I kind of got ahead of myself, but I wanted to make sure you get it into the record. God's love God loves us and keeps no records of our sins. He loves us and keeps no record of our sins. 1 Corinthians 13 and 5. It, being loved, does not dishonor others. I'm going to stop here real quick. Love does not what? If you're a Republican, love doesn't dishonor a Democrat. And if you're a Democrat, love doesn't dishonor a Republican. Oh, that was very quiet on that one. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily, easily angered. And it keeps what? No records of wrong. What a beautiful, beautiful thing. No records of past sins. 
Aren't you glad of that? Now, do I dare ask? How many of us keep records of past wrongs? God's not compiling that list, and neither should we be compiling list of past wrongs done against us. I told you this is going to be hard. Amen? And through God's love, his grace, and mercy. Again, I am not going to hell. I don't have to go. That's something awesome about God's forgiveness, isn't it? I do not have to go. The next benefit of of God's forgiveness is this. We are purified from all unrighteousness. Purified from us, where we started with that verse. But it says here, if we confess our sins. How many see that word confess? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we have to stop and ask ourselves here, what does the word confess mean? You ready for it? How many want to know what the word confess means? It means to agree with God. When I confess my sin, I am agreeing that God is correct about my sin situation. God is correct about the things that are in my life that are wrong. No matter what my excuses may be, no matter what my culture may say, God is correct and God is right. When I confess my sins to God, God, I say, I'm confessing my sins to you. I am com- confessing that you are right about my sins. And because you're right about my sins, I want to be forgiven. I want to be set free. And you know what? And if we confess our sins, here's what we have a guarantee. He is what? faithful and just and will forgive us. Our God's faithful. Now, sometimes when it comes to my situation where I need to forgive other people, I maybe have a list, but sometimes I'm not faithful because I want to hold on to it. I want to make them pay. And I want them to do and act like I want them to act before I'll even consider forgiven. Anyone else like that? That's hard. But I can also tell you with this, the truth, it can be accomplished because God has done that in my life for me. I grew up in such a way that there was family members that I did not like and even to the point where I hated them because they were abusive. Bad things had happened. I hated them. And God sick me, well, well, you know, in a loving, caring way. And every time I come up with a loophole where I could hold on to that for unforgiveness, God showed me a scripture. How dare he do that? <laughs> Amen? And I finally got to the place where I made the conscious decision, I choose to forgive that person. And you know what happened? God's grace and God's power. I can honestly stay, stand up here today, and I'm saying this hum, with humility. There is no one in my life today that I know that I hate. And that's because of God's grace and mercy and strength. And that's because I am thankful, very thankful, for the grace he's given me to forgive me. And I don't have that in my life right now. I say I'm humble because I don't want it back. I mean, pride goes before a fall, and, you know. And that's something all of us need to examine ourselves here. Is there anyone in our lives that we're holding unforgiveness towards? And I'll get to more of that in just uh, here in a little bit. Amen? But he purifies us, and this promise is guaranteed to us because of God's character. God is trustworthy. His promises are yea and amen. And because of his righteousness, because of his holiness, and because of the death of his son, he cleanses me from all unrighteousness. And that is a promise that he has given to each and every one of us. And again, he imputes to us his righteousness and develops his righteous character in us as we begin to learn to serve and and, and to live for him. Everyone agreed, said? Amen. The next benefit of forgiveness is this. We are empowered to do the works of Jesus in greater numbers and in his name. 
And the Holy Spirit, as I was looking at this, was showing, you know, how many want to see great and mighty works take place in the church? How many want to see miracles take place? These signs shall follow them that believe. And for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit just emphasized to me, for that to happen, we've got to get a grasp on this forgiveness thing. Amen? We've got to have a grasp on what it means to be forgiven and to be forgivers if we're going to see these kind of things happen in a greater way. First John, uh, John, not First John, John 14 and 12 says, Verily, verily, truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I go, to, I go to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask, you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will what? I will do it. Is that the word of God? Did I make that up? That is God's word. And I believe, saints of God, that if we could get this forgiveness thing where we need to have it, I can I almost believe this with my whole heart. I do, I do believe it with my whole heart is this way. We were going to see more of these things happen. Because unforgiveness is a bondage in a Christian's life that will hinder our prayer life. I told you this was going to be hard. And let me put it this way. You put scripture to scripture. If we ask anything according to his what? Will. Ask anything according to his will and ask in his name. We shall have what we desire. Other scriptures say that. And what happens is when you're walking in unforgiveness, it's hard to hear the voice of God. When you're walking in unforgiveness, it's hard to see clearly what God wants to do because you have this big, ugly monster in your life. And it, is, it is worse than any disease you could think of because this, 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 this horrible thing called unforgiveness not only destroys your mental bottle, your, mental, your mind, it destroys your physical body, it destroys your eternal life, it destroys things and it blinds people. And that's why it's such a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous thing. So, saints of God, we want to look at the works of Jesus real quick here. And how do I find out what the works of Jesus are? Well, go to the Gospels, first place, and begin to read your Bible. Everyone agree with that said? Amen. Amen. And you see, and when you read your Bible, you see the works that Jesus is doing, but you also see an urgency in his work, and you also see an excitement in his work. When Jesus speaks, when you read through this new, the, the Gospels, when Jesus speaks, immediately, I say that word immediately, when Jesus speaks, immediately decisive responses come. Immediately. I like that. And when Jesus acts, immediately decisive responses happen. When he spoke to Lazarus, immediately what happened? When he spoke to the winds and the waves, immediately what happened? Saints of God, if we ask anything according to his will, ask anything in his name, decisive results will take place because Jesus has all authority over all the universe. Amen? And then he says, I give unto you, I give unto you authority. What authority is he talking about? The authority that he has. I don't have all the authority he has, but he gives us authority in this world to do what he's been doing. That's exciting, amen? Jesus has authority over sickness. He has authority over demons. He has authority over nature. And he has authority over death. He has that authority. And when Jesus rebukes an illness, guess what? Great things happen. When he told a blind man that his eyes were healed, hallelujah, it happened. When Jesus multiplied the fish and the loaves, I'm getting ahead of myself over nature, he multiplied the fish and the loaves, and guess what happened? They multiplied. And when Jesus spoke to the winds and the waves, they obeyed. I wonder if that would work with our kids. No. <laughs> Jesus has authority over death. How does he have authority over death? Because he endured death on the cross. He went to that grave. Hallelujah. But on the third day, he came out of that grave, the victorious King of kings and the Lord of lords, with the keys of death, hell, and the grave in his hand. He didn't go down to the pits of hell to suffer at Satan's feet. He went down there to defeat Satan. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. And when Jesus rebukes a demon, they ask how high and how far. Amen? That's the kind of authority he had. And guess what he says? The things I do, you shall do even more. What's the key here? I'm going to tell you, we'll get back to the keys, forgiveness. Amen? The same ministry as Jesus. You say, Pastor, have you ever been in a situation where you had cast out a demon? I have. Several times. Hannah probably doesn't remember because she was a baby when we were in Gary, Indiana. I want to tell you, I had demon-possessed people coming into the church who were part of a local witch's coven. And I can guarantee you, I saw the power of God work casting out demons. Real demon possession. Not this phony stuff out there because you have an itch, you got a demon. Real demon possession, those who were involved in the occult. This one man came up to me, and he'd just been to the church the first time. He was a lot taller than I am. I mean, he was probably 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", a big guy. And he walks up and goes, I'm demon possessed. And I'm going, oh, brother, here we go again. And so I'm going to do the pastoral thing. I'm going to pray for him. And as I put my hand out to pray for him, he came completely up off the floor like he levitated here in the middle. And then he started flopping on the floor back and forth. I mean, violently, uh, just going back and forth. And I'm going, uh-oh, I got the real thing going on here. And I still remember looking at him and saying, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And you know what? He went still. Just like that. And then I got to, to lead him to Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Because if I hadn't led him to Jesus, those things would have come back seven times worse. But when we are where we need to be with God, hallelujah, those things do not have to scare us. We don't have to be fearful of them because greater is he that is in us than what? He that is in the world. And I can remember, too, that same, there was a lady at the church there called La Sharon. I know some of you have heard the stories before. And she was a practicing witch. She came in and brought me a little booklet. This little booklet was full of occultic-type spells. And she says, we use the Bible just like you do. Because it had scripture with their occultic type stuff. And, but it went on to things that was absolutely not Bible whatsoever. It was very occultic. And she handed it to me and, and she says, would you take this? I said, I'll take it. And I stuck it in the pulpit. And we had revival service. But what I started to notice here where we were having fellowship time, anytime I got near her, and I had an evangelist there, and anytime the evangelist got to her, she winced back like this. I mean, you could just tell, and her face just contorted. It was just something really odd, you know. And again, this woman who was involved in the occult was demon-possessed. And so I was getting ready to lay hands on her. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, no, call the ladies of the church forward to pray for her. Called the ladies of the church, and they laid their hands on her, and they prayed for her, and you could see her whole countenance change. It was like something came off of her face. She was a new person, and she got gloriously delivered, and they led her to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It was glorious. Amen? And then that little booklet she gave me, she was petrified of that booklet after that. What do I do? You want to be fearful of this? She said, but they're driving around the church, and they're praying against you guys right now. Woo, glory to God. You can't curse what God is blessing and they're trying to curse us and, and it, it was it was just a glorious so I took I said we're going to go out in front of the church we're going to open up the door and this is Gary Indiana by the way not a safe place to be and I opened up the big metal doors and our doors in our church were big metal heavy doors okay they were so you could not break in even though they were able to do it and so we decided I, I decided I believe by the power of the Holy Spirit I was going to burn that occult book right there in front of God and everybody and our parsonage was so close to the house, you know, you could just always reach over. So I, I opened, we had the garage door open. I got some gasoline. Then I got some church bulletins, and I soaked everything with gasoline. I wanted to make sure that thing was going to burn. And so we lit it. The thing just flew like that. All the church bulletins that were on the top of it and the bottom, on the top of it and the bottom, they all, they, you know, they were all intact after the fire. You know what burnt? Only that occultic book burned in that fire. And what did that say to her? 
God is real. God is. I'm not saying that's going to happen every time, but it proved to her beyond any shadow of doubt. She saw the gasoline on the bulletin. She saw the gasoline on her occultic book, and only the occultic bur- bur- book burned away and left the other bulletins in perfect shape, except they were soaked in gasoline. Now, how did that happen? Her brother later came back to the church and said this to us. He said, I came with two five-gallon gas cans that I was going to throw on the church building and light it while you guys are in there. But every time I went to step my foot on that property, some kind of power like electricity hit me and knocked me backwards. Glory to his name. Saints of God, that shouldn't be a one-time thing. It shouldn't be, is there going to be a miracle? How many miracles today is God going to do? Amen? The demons have to obey. And I believe this right now. Satan, you get your hands off our family. You get your fa- off our family members, off our kids, our parents. Get your hands off of them in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. The next benefit of forgiveness is this, that we are conformed to the image of his Son. We're conformed into the image of his Son. Romans 8 and 29. For, God, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, I want to just hit something. I don't want to get on predestination here, but just for a moment. Some people read this portion of Scripture and says you're either predestined to heaven or you're predestined to hell. That's not what's predestined here. The plan of salvation was predestined from the foundations of the world, and then it's up to us if we're going to follow God's plan of predestination for salvation. That's, it's not the individual. How horrible would it be to live your whole life for God and not know if you're going to make it or not? My grandmother was that way. She did not know if she was going to make it to heaven. She went to church. She prayed regularly, but she knew she was told and was taught that you don't know if you're going to heaven until you die. At that moment, you'll find out. I know so. Because a plan of salvation was predestined from the foundations of the world. Now it's up to me to choose to either go that route or choose the other route. Everyone agreed, said? The plan of salvation was predestined so we could become like Jesus. Not God, but like Jesus. And Jesus had these authorities over all of these things. And God led him. And, you know, the Father led him. Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do. Isn't that what he said? And when we are conformed to his image, we're going to do what Jesus does. We're going to act like God. And then we're going to be listening like Jesus did. And we're going to do what our Father has led us to do. We're going to listen and obey, for there's no other way. Amen? The next benefit of forgiveness, I'm going to preach faster here, so you hang in there, okay? Anyway, I got an extra hour anyway. (laughs) The next benefit of forgiveness is this. We can be, you ready for this? We enter the abundant life that Jesus came to give us. Saints of God, how many believe that Jesus came to give you life and more, more, have it more abundantly? That abundant life, please don't limit it to finances. I've heard so many people that that abundant life is just about money. It may include money, but the abundant life is so much more. You know why the, the, the abundant life isn't money? Because we're going to leave it all behind. All the material things that money buys, thank God for them. Thank God for the blessings, but we're not taking it with us. The abundant life is victory in Jesus. The abundant life is being an overcomer and being a conqueror. The abundant life is knowing where Satan belongs underneath our feet. The abundant life is acting and living and serving God in his blessings. The abundant life is contentment. And whatever situation you find yourself in, amen? The abundant life is a divine calling of God that we enter into to be more like Jesus. The abundant life is a way of joy and peace and happiness in the midst of no matter what the trial is, no matter how this election turns out, I can still have the way of joy and peace and righteousness in my life. Amen? My joy and peace isn't dependent upon who the president is. My joy and peace is, is dependent upon the, the Prince of Peace. Amen? And God can give us a peace that passes all understanding. Our next benefit is this, that we can be baptized with the Holy Spirit of God. 
Amen? Mark 1 and 7 through 8. <laughs> and this was the message. After me comes one more powerful than I, that's the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with what? The Holy Ghost. That's the, John the Baptist is talking here, and John the Baptist is preaching repentance, which is good. They had to have their repentance first, amen? And, and he said, but here's a, a baptism of forgiveness. Thank God that. But after forgiveness, there's something even greater for you. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Those who, have got, those who are saved today, you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you. Hallelujah. He wants us to have the person of the Holy Spirit in our life. He wants us to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. I want, to know right now, I want you to know right now, if you've see, received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the person of the Holy Spirit in you this moment. But he also wants you to have the power of the Holy Spirit also. Amen? Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the other ends of the earth. God wants us to be spirit-filled people. Hallelujah. He wants us to receive that dunamis. He wants to receive that power. And it happens after we are forgiven. Amen? The next one is this, saints of God. The next benefit of forgiveness is this. The continual abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. He says, I won't leave you as what? Orphans. I am with you always. I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. I am with you until the end of the age. And then we go to the next age. Amen? He is with us. <laughs> and Acts 2 and 17 says this. In the last days, God says, I will pour out of my spirit on how many people? Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams what we need ain't it or isn't it <laughs> amen leads me to the next one here we will be saved from the wrath to come upon the whole world revelations 3 and 10 says this i will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come to the whole world to test to test the inhabitants of the earth you know what that is that's the wrath of God after the church is raptured out of here. And he says, I'll do what? I will keep you from that wrath. Why is he keeping us from that wrath? Because we have not been appointed unto God's wrath in the end times. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath talking about the end time tribulation, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus. How many are saved today? Forgiveness. <laughs> You're not going to go through that great end time period. Amen? We're not going to be here for the tribulation. He died for us so that whether you are awake or asleep, whether you are alive or you are dead, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. It's dealing with the rapture of the church here. When, the, the, when we are absent from the body, we're present with the Lord, but at the resurrection, our spirit that's in heaven gets, gets back to this new glorified body, and then those who are alive and remain, we change, we'll go out to meet the Lord forever, and forevermore be with the Lord. Isn't that great, saints? Amen. Next to you, I'm going to hit real, real fast. I've got to get to my last point. The next benefit of forgiveness is this. He has given us his divine power for everything. Everything you need in life, his divine power is there. The next one is this. The next benefit is heaven. Aren't you glad we're going to get to go to heaven? One of these days, I'm going to hear that trumpet sound, yes. One of these days, I may go by the grave. I'm believing for the trumpet first. But one of these days, I am going to go to that city whose builder and maker is God. No more pain, no more sickness, no more disease, no more suffering, no more politics. Leads me to point two of the message. Forgiven by God to be forgivers. The benefit of salvation is awesome. Everyone agree? Awesome. We are never more like Jesus than when we are forgiving people. We want to be conformed to the image of him. We have to learn to be forgivers, just like Jesus was. Amen? The first fact about forgiving people is this. God has forgiven us. We must 
forgive those who hurt us and sinned against us. I want to say this again. As God has forgiven us, we what? Must forgive those who have hurt us. Now, I want to look at a portion of Scripture here real quick. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Peter comes up, and the, the kind of the Jewish culture thing was, you forgive a person three times, and after that, ah. So Peter comes up and going, hey, Lord. Verse 18, then Peter came to Jesus, asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. I've doubled it. Look at me, God. I have doubled it. And then Jesus answers, I tell you, not seven times, but ready for this? Seventy times seventy. Now, some of you are going one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> okay, you're going to get up there, right? But you have to understand that phrase, 70 times 70, there in the Greek means unlimited amount. And then Jesus, to make sure that they understand this, he goes into a little story for us. And verse 23, therefore, the, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle the accounts of his servants. Okay? And as he begins the settlement, a man who owed him, you ready for this? 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, I tried to figure out how many 10,000 uh, bags of gold would be worth, and the nearest I could figure out is a whole bunch. More than any person could ever repay. Amen? Never could repay it. That's what our sin's like. We can never repay it. Amen? And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all he had be sold to repay the debt. But verse 26, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him and said, I want you to remember this phrase, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. And verse 27, the servant's master, what? took pity on him and didn't say, okay, I'm going to let you go and I'm waiting for you to pay it all off. He says, cancel the debt and let him go. What did God do for us? He canceled our debt and let us go. You don't think he'd be grateful? I mean, wow. To have, I would love someone to come in and cancel out all my debt. Anyone else like that? Would you be grateful? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But the next sentence starts with a but, which means it's going to cancel out what we just read. But when that servant went out, the one who had just been forgiven of the 10,000 bags of gold, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. And it's as like, near as I can figure out, those 100 silver coins were dimes. And he owed $10. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. Ready? Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. Sound familiar? Verse 30. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Verse 31. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that happened. Verse 32. Then the master called the servant in, and look what the master said to him. You wicked servant. You ungrateful servant. He said, I canceled all your debt. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Now look at verse 33. How many have been forgiven? You're under the blood of Jesus. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? 
And what the master is saying here, just as I forgave you your <laughs> big bag of gold debts, you should have forgiven that $10 debt. Now, verse 34. In his in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be what? Until he should pay all he owed. He can't pay it. Can't pay it. And he's going to be tortured until he can. Verse 35. Now listen to this. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Does that mean he added up all the old sins and brought them back? No. This current sin of unforgiveness is going to destroy you. But you notice it said forgive from what? Oh, I forgive them. You what that person did to me. You may say it with your words, but you haven't done it with your heart. Forgive from the heart. It doesn't mean they're not guilty or wrong. It sets you free. Mark 11 and 25. And when you stand praying, isn't that a good thing to be standing praying? If you hold anything against anyone, for what? Forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. See the danger of unforgiveness? It's a dangerous thing. It hinders prayer. Matthew 6 and 15. But if you do not forgive others their sins, now this has gone beyond brothers and sisters. It's to forgive others. Their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Which leads me to the next the, the, the point here. Refusing to forgive others causes us to forfeit our salvation and the benefits of salvation. Well, once saved, always saved. You better read that scripture again. Jesus gave that story for a purpose to show us how dangerous it is to hold unforgiveness when we have been forgiven, no matter how we justify it. Amen? I don't know about you, but I do not want to forfeit the benefits of forgiveness. Anyone want to forfeit those? And I definitely don't want to forfeit heaven for hell. And if we are walking in unforgiveness, our prayer life will be hindered. The answers of prayers are not going to be what we are expecting or wanting. We will be down and discouraged. We will be depressed. And we lose out on the blessings of of God. Do you want me to tickle them now or do you want me to keep going? Is it worth trading away God's benefits of salvation and trading away heaven, holding on to what someone has done to you and offended you, sinned against you? And one of the things of unforgiveness is that we don't like to really think about is taking on offenses. An offense is unforgiveness. It's just another way of saying it. They offended me. Forgive them. They've done me wrong. Forgive them. Yes, they have, but forgive them. Did we do Jesus wrong? And he did what? Forgave us. Forgiveness is not about the other person. It's about you entering the abundant life in Jesus Christ. It's about you having your prayers answered, you not having to deal with discouragement and depression and all those kinds of things. That unforgiveness, the root of bitterness, the root of unforgiveness destroys our emotional minds. It destroys our physical bodies and it will destroy our spiritual life and even cause us to lose eternity. It's not worth it, child of God. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you and praise you so much for your word. And Jesus, we do thank you for all the benefits of salvation that you have provided to us. Wow, thank you, Jesus.
but Lord, also help us to be like you since we are forgiven and since we so much appreciate all this that you have done for us. We're so grateful and so thankful that you took our place and forgave us and paid a debt that we could never pay. Help us, Lord Jesus, not to be like that unjust servant who went out and grabbed one of his fellow friends that owed him a little something and refused to forgive. And Lord, I pray, be patient with us as we make these decisions to take those people who have hurt us off of our hooks and place them on your hook. And today, through the power of your spirit, we make a decision to release the offender. We make a decision not to allow that bitterness to hold us any longer, and we're going to walk in a new freedom because you have come to set us free, and we rebuke that, 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 that unforgiveness. We command it to loose us and be gone, and we make a decision to stand upon God's word. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and I now release that bitterness. I release that unforgiveness, and Lord, I give it to you to take care of. And now, Lord, I want to receive that freedom. I want to receive that power. I want to receive that anointing. In your name we pray. And all God's people agreed, said amen and amen. One quick announcement real quick. The th our Thanksgiving dinner will be tonight at 5 p.m. here at the church. There's a sign-up sheet out there. Just kind of sign up for some sides and bring it in. And you can see what's being brought. We're going to have a good time of fellowship together. Amen? And don't let someone you're angry at keep you from coming. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.